Hello, St. Lukers, and welcome to Your Week with St. Luke's, the weekly podcast that helps you be more connected to our weekly scripture text so that you can learn God's story as we seek to lead more faithful lives together as a church. I am Pastor Melissa. I'm one of the pastors at St. Luke's UMC in Orlando, and I am excited to be your guide for the next few weeks as we continue exploring the early church in the book of Acts in our series follow-up to our last series, St. Luke's On Purpose, with a new series, Church On Purpose. We're going to be looking more broadly at what it means to be church as individuals, with one another, and as a community all together. Now, as we have already seen, if you've been with us the last few weeks, the book of Acts gives us an incredible amount of insight into the foundations of what it means to be church. We see the earliest disciples, the ones closest to Jesus' actual life and teachings, starting to develop systems and structures that allowed them to live out the fullness of this new way of being in the ancient Near East. Now, today we are going to look at the story of a particular disciple, and the significant impact they made in those early days of Christianity. And once we get through the story, you might be surprised at who I'm talking about when I say disciple. So let's get going. Now our text today is from Acts chapter 9, and we're looking at verses 36 through 42. So you can follow along with me as we see what the Apostle Peter is up to, starting in verse 36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. Her life overflowed with good works and compassionate acts on behalf of those in need. About that time, though, she became so ill that she died. And after they washed her body, they laid her in an upstairs room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, when the disciples heard that Peter was there, they sent two people to Peter. And they urged, please come right away. And so Peter went with them. Upon his arrival, he was taken to the upstairs room. All the widows stood beside him, crying as they showed the tunics and other clothing Dorcas made when she was alive. Peter sent everyone out of the room and then knelt and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hand and raised her up, and then he called God's holy people, including the widows, and presented her alive to them. The news spread throughout Joppa, and many put their faith in the Lord. Now, like so many pieces of of scripture that we find in the New Testament, and especially in the Gospels and Acts, we get here a story of healing. In fact, it's a story of actually raising someone from the dead. And this is especially powerful as it's Peter who is initiating that miracle, claiming the power that Jesus named was now in the disciples themselves. Now, Peter's locale for this event is also particularly interesting. He is in Joppa, which is modern-day Tel Aviv. And if that ancient city name sounds familiar, it's probably for good reason, because Joppa was the city that we found Jonah in when God sent him in the Hebrew Bible to go and preach in Nineveh to the Ninevites. Now, Joppa was the seaport city where Jonah ran away because he didn't want to answer God's call to preach to pagans. And so here we have Peter in the same city with a similar call. Only this time, Peter chooses to answer answer God's call willingly and participate in God's message to a Gentile audience. And it's here that we meet a woman who is probably one that most of us have not spent much time learning about. Her name is Tabitha or Dorcas. She has two names, one Aramaic and one Greek, which emphasizes the multicultural nature of the area at this time and the complex nature of the work the early disciples were undertaking in sharing the good news. Now, this isn't the first time we see Peter performing a healing miracle in Acts. In chapter 3, we get a healing story that matches a more standard miracle account. Peter heals a lame man at the beautiful gate, After which, he preaches an extensive sermon with long theological explanations of what just happened, outlining the implications of what it means for who God is and God's relationship to us and what we need to believe. And 
And so this healing of Tabitha is probably overlooked a lot of times because it doesn't fit the standard miracle story mold. We get no theological explanation. We get no sermon. We get no long diatribe before or after the healing from Peter or from anyone. But we get some things that are even more interesting, in my opinion. You see, very seldom when we encounter a healing in scripture, do we get the name of the person being healed. We usually just hear their affliction, hear they have been healed, and then a declaration of God's power, because that's what it's really about, right? But in this story, Luke doesn't spend any time on that. Luke here spends time telling us about this woman. We get her name. We get two names, in fact. We get her resume. We get testimonials about who she was. There is something different going on in this particular story. And notice that Peter isn't sent for by her family, but by community members. We hear that she is an upstanding member of the community, an essential member of the community, especially to those in need. She was generous and selfless and compassionate. And we hear the the, the testimonies of the widows who were there mourning her death. And they are there not just in word, but they actually show Peter the clothes that she made for them. Because it seems that this woman has taken seriously the call of the church to care for the widows of the community. And because we get her Aramaic and Greek names, it means that she wouldn't have just been known in the faith community, but also the wider community. Her religious practice of generosity and compassion was not secret. It wasn't contained just to those who were part of the church. She practiced her faith in public. She contributed not only to help those who were part of the church, but she contributed to those who were needy in the whole community to the point that her name was known in both Jewish and Greek circles. She has provided security and comfort to those whose social status has rendered them in life insecure and uncomfortable. And we see both in the request for Peter's healing presence as well as in the image of that gathered community mourning her, that her death is not only about mourning and sorrow for her loss, but there's a sense that her loss brings a loss of security to the community at whole. It's not simply a loss of relationship, it's a loss of a vital part of the whole community's stability and the whole community's hope. And as a result, we get a singularity in the New Testament as part of this story. Not only that it's an unusual miracle account, but in this story, we get the only use of the female form of the Greek word for disciple, which is used for Tabitha. Now we know that Jesus had many female disciples, but it's only in this moment that any New Testament writer felt it unavoidable to use this designation. Dorcas or Tabitha has the distinction of being the only person in the New Testament specifically designated as a female disciple. And that identification is not made based on her belief or her prayer life or her worship attendance. Luke specifies that her discipleship recognition is about her generosity. It's about her good works and her care for the community. And we will see a similar designation when we get to the conversion of Cornelius soon after, because this is how Luke understands discipleship. One commentary put it this way and said, A disciple for Luke is a person, male or female, who follows Jesus out of the waters of baptism into a life of healing, reconciliation, confrontation with those holding religious and political power, and love. The character of Dorcas's discipleship is one of provision and compassion, tending to the needs of the neediest around her. In the public square, she confronts the prevailing patriarchal understanding of discipleship by modeling discipleship not defined by gender. So there are a lot of possibilities that we can consider from these choices that Luke has made in telling Tabitha's story. First and not least, Luke considers her to be fully equivalent to any of the male disciples who are named in early Christian literature. 
And second, we get the idea that Luke wants to emphasize discipleship based on action, not simply belief. We might consider that being part of why this miracle comes with no theologizing or, or sermonizing. The actions speak for themselves, both Tabitha's and Peter's. A miracle performed without interpretation can still make a deep impression and can still provide for deep edification of the community and maybe even more so than when we name too explicitly those implications. Because while on the surface, it seems like Peter is intended to be the main character of this story, we recognize that he is not. And we might say that Tabitha is actually the main character of the story. I would say that's a little closer to true, but ultimately, it's not her either. The true headliner in this story is God. God who uses Peter to heal Tabitha. God whose work in Jesus has inspired Tabitha to use what resources and privileges she had to help bring wholeness and healing to her community. And, and as a quick aside, we actually don't know what her social status was. She may have been uncommonly wealthy and privileged and using that to make a difference for others rather than herself. Or she may have also been a widow herself, recognizing the needs of her peers and self-sacrificing in a different way out of her own disenfranchisement. Not only as a woman, but also a widow. We don't know and we can't know. And there may be intentionality in Luke's omission of this detail as discipleship and self-sacrificial action and public service and care are not callings only on people from certain social strata. They are universal characteristics of discipleship. Because we see not only that she was helping those in need, she was in community with those who were in need in her community, whether it was because that was already her community or whether she recognized that that was the call of discipleship is to be among the community. And so her healing, being raised from the dead, brings with it not only comfort and joy for those who are closest to her, but also the resurrection of hope for the outcasts of her community and for anyone who was isolated or alienated or beaten down or oppressed in her society. And so when we think about being church on purpose, what does this mean? Well, I hope it first helps us identify the true marks of a life of discipleship. It's how we lead our lives beyond the walls of our homes or the church. What are we known for in our communities? How are we known in spaces that are not church spaces? You know, in the 1800s, there were a number of Dorcas societies started in churches to provide food and clothing to the poor in honor of Dorcas. But I wonder whether a formal organization is what Dorcas example gives us. Because I think her example is really more just about how we lead our individual lives. Her resurrection is in so many ways a mirror of Jesus' resurrection, which also didn't come with great theological exposition in most of the early writings about it. Like Jesus, this resurrection becomes a beacon of hope, even for today, for those who were neglected or abused by the most powerful in society. And the community members don't directly ask for Peter to bring her back to life. We can assume they hoped for it. They had heard stories, right? But their purpose was actually to make sure that the leadership of the movement knew who she was and the impact she had made on their community. You see, her resurrection miracle is not merely the restoration of one person. It was a resurrection for the whole community. New life for her, like new life in Christ, means renewed hope for all who are hopeless. As one commentary says, such a bold confirmation of community love has a tendency to spread outward, to touch even more lives until like the Holy Spirit moving like wind and fire, it brings hope and sustenance to multitudes. As the popular song says, they will know we are Christians by our love. So some of our work as the church on purpose is to embrace our own discipleship, to see ourselves as the church, not only when we're gathered with others, but to see that where we go, the church is there. 
Where we go, Jesus is there. Where we go, we bring with us the power of resurrection. And so I think today's text leaves us with the question, what would the world look like if everyone who claimed the identity of the church lived their life like Tabitha? May we be that church, and I look forward to continuing this conversation with you next week.